Good morning, good morning, good morning. Another wet day in paradise. How are you? Let me just get on the road. That's it. They pulled all those trees up, burned them all, massive great pyres. Spread the ashes, spread all that lime using a, some sort of spreading machine. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh. So, busy day today, I'm a bit early today. Had a ton of people ring over the weekend. Oh, hello. Sorry. I'm talking to which, you know, that was someone ringing. That was someone ringing. So. We've got, uh, I was going to talk to you about uh, collectivists versus capitalists, but uh, we might have better time for that, but it's worthwhile having sort of considered the uh, uh, problems of uh, dealing with a contracting business, not a failing business, but just one that's has, is, is, uh, has a decreasing volume of work with the uh, problems of dealing with an expanding business. And the uh, problem you've got, of course, is capacity. So you've got a situation where you've got uh, demand and supply. And I'm talking about a situation where the demand simply starts to exceed the supply. Now, the first thing you can do is just buffer the uh, supply. So, you know, instead of being booked up one day ahead or two days ahead, you end up getting booked up a week ahead or two weeks ahead or even three months ahead, which was uh, my very first surgery was booked up three months ahead. And that's because um, of this phenomenon you get whereby uh, let's say someone comes in and they need four, four uh, appointments, then if you're only booked up a few days ahead, they'll just make one and then come in and make the next one. If you're booked up three months ahead, then what they'll do is they'll make all four and then in, and possibly five, you know, just in case they can't make one and have to cancel it. And um, so you get this uh, vicious circle where all of a sudden your booking explodes out of control and it takes a bit of time to soak through because at the moment I mean we've we went from a you know situation where two years ago you could get an appointment a filling appointment the same week to a situation now where we're on uh, emergencies this week and fillings next week and we'll pretty well get to the point I think where it'll be emergencies this week it's always emergencies this week but perhaps fillings in two weeks time or something and what will happen is people start to uh, it starts to sink through you know as people come in and realize that the situation has changed a bit um, yeah so one of the biggest problems that we're finding is uh, just the administration gets forgotten. Not forgotten, but, you know, remains undone. Things le left in your inbox, bills get postponed, payment of bills. Um, things that you need to do, you know, to reach your objectives, like uh, applying for things or uh, getting refunds on things, they all just sort of falls by the by and so again this adds to your booking problems you end up uh, these things either don't get done or you have to start to put aside some special administrative uh, sessions
So, how do you expand capacity? Well, the problem with dentistry is that you're really only earning money while you personally are in the surgery. Um, I know, I mean, I'm leaving aside the whole argument of uh, sort of uh, being a, opening a small chain of dental practices and having a ton of associates and stuff like that. That is a completely different kettle of fish, you know. Then, then if you're going to go down that road, you've then got to start looking at your expenses and uh, how much you pay your associates and whether you can make a profit, you know, paying your associates and on a fixed percentage basis or, a, you know, surgery rental or whatever. I mean, that whole, that whole, you know, I've done all that. I did, all, I did it all arguably when it was easy when, you know, there was no uh, work rationing in terms of uh, workload through UDAs. And, uh, and and at a time where there was enough money coming in to be able to pay the associates. So initially it was 50%, then it went down to 45%. But, um, you know, it was, it was not that difficult. You could take on an associate at 45% and know that you were going to make some money or enough money to pay the bills and have a bit left over. Um, then it got to the stage where, I'd say about 2004, where, uh, you know, I, I, I was taken on as an associate by someone uh, because he was rushed off his feet. And so he took on, he took me on and he paid me, I think, 45% because he knew that I knew that that's, that's what a reasonable wage would be. But then when I looked at his expenses, he had a, his expense ratio was about 50 to 60%. Which meant that for every 100 pounds that I uh, grossed, 60 pounds, uh, 60, 60 pounds went on his expenses. Um, 45 pounds went on my wages. And that left him with um, minus five pounds in profit. So in other words, he was he was paying me to work there, which then it further added to his financial stress. So instead of taking me on to relieve his financial stress, taking me on and aggravated his financial stress. Anyway, so um, I mean, I bought a practice that had three uh, surgeries. One of them was very small, two of them are reasonably, you know, sized. And at the moment, there's one dentist, one hygienist, or at least there will be when she comes back to work. So, I mean, I'm alternating between the two chairs, but the problem is there's still only one of me. Now, supposing I take on an associate, um, that's going to be a problem because we have this uh, situation where you have to leave the surgery empty for an hour after every filling or half an hour after every filling and half an hour after every sonic scaling and so uh, at the moment we're alternating chairs but with two dentists working there we wouldn't be able to I mean the alternative would be to take on a dentist just to cover the days that I'm not there uh, but I'm increasingly I mean I didn't used to be there Tuesdays because the hygienist was there and then I wasn't there uh, Thursdays if we didn't have enough patients, but I am now. And uh, I don't work Friday afternoon because um, I just find at the age of, you know, I'm in my 60s and I don't, I just don't relish, the, I mean, I've been doing this job for 40 years. I just don't relish the idea of working five days a week. Uh, and the patients would have you working Saturday mornings if you go. So, what do you do, you know, I mean, for, and also there's this other possibility that it's a temporary blip. You know, you shouldn't assume that just because you're a firework and you're going up, 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 uh, that it's going to carry on like that. Uh, my experience is that uh, a slow and steady growth of the sort that we've experienced is, is probably sustainable and, uh, and in a way can, can even accelerate because there's a sort of a exponential uh, quality to it in that two people tell four and four people tell eight and 
etc. Um, so you can under you can undergo a period of hyperbolic growth, but then it's very difficult to expand hyperbolically. Um, so, what another way that you can suppress demand is to increase fees, and uh, any economist will tell you this that. Uh, Your, uh, basically, you know, there's this curve, isn't there? Demand, supply, demand curve, and if you uh, shift it whichever way is up, upper prices, then that suppresses demand. I mean, that's. Uh, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, that is capitalism in the raw. That is the situation where you know there's a petrol shortage, and the petrol station should um, should be allowed to charge more if the petrol is in short supply. Everybody thinks, oh, it's gouging, you know, because they're charging ten pound, ten pound a litre or whatever. But basically, that's how the market sorts itself out. Uh, Peter Schiff did a very good uh, piece on this, where he said that if you allow prices to rise when there are temporary shortages, then um, it encourages people to think twice about hoarding and it encourages uh, people who got petrol to either get it moving or uh, get it um, stored, you know, so that they can uh, sell it. And it also uh, brings in uh, revenue to the petrol station so that they can build bigger tanks or at least uh, keep more on uh, stock on supply, you know. So that people can uh, have petrol if there is a temp more of a irons out supply curve, you know. So yeah, so we could put our prices up. Um, I mean, obviously, everyone's very reluctant to put prices up. If you take a country like Japan, for example, uh, it's almost unheard of to increase prices. Once you've got a customer. Uh, and you agree a price schedule with them, you know, that, that what you're going to charge them. You never ever go back to them and say, I'm going to charge you more for the same thing. Um, whereas with new customers, obviously the sky's the limit. You can, you can make whatever arrangement you like with new customers, but existing customers tend to get locked in at the existing price. Um, Japan's a very strange economy. I must, uh, I must study Japan more closely because they've got a there's a situation where a country has printed money and has been printing money since since the mid 90s uh, has very very little inflation where the uh, their equivalent of the Federal Reserve Bank owns half the stock exchange and uh, half of uh, Apple by the sound of it etc etc and yet uh, the whole country uh, carries on functioning pretty much as normal. So, yeah, it's very difficult with dentistry to have different prices for different people because um, I'm, I'm acutely aware that there is some discussion behind the scenes amongst the patients about the sort of the deal they're getting. In our case, not so much about whether or not we're taking on patients in whichever category, but certainly, uh, I mean, we used to get a lot of, uh, when I worked on the health service, like, you know, you try, you know, you quoted me £200 for a crown, and my friends told me I could get this for £30 on the NHS. Um, you know, to which the answer was, well, you need, you know, you need to go and see that person's dentist then because you can't get it on the NHS from me. Yeah, so, um, you know, and then, I mean, how would it work if you had what, a husband and wife and husband got charged one fee for a crown and wife got charged another, you know? I know, you know, to a certain extent, I mean, how would they know, you know? It's a different tooth and different circumstances, different time. They might assume it's a different crown. But I don't like that sort of uh, 
our, our pricing structure is designed to be completely transparent. I mean, we literally, not only transparent, but simple. Simple enough to be transparent. It's not just a case of uh, sending someone a quote. We literally include, like for example, uh, with a checkup, we include x-rays, you know. With a root treatment, we include blocking up the uh, access chamber with a filling. We don't, we don't charge extra for a filling. We don't charge extra for x-rays in connection with root treatments. We don't, uh, even for an implant, it includes the crown. Uh, so, so you have far fewer prices. And as a result, it's far simpler to understand and therefore far more transparent. Uh, in addition to literally every, every single person who's ever had any treatment with us has had a quote from me within a day. Uh, and usually with about five or ten pages of supporting information. Uh, you know, which regards to the, which adds up to the total sum of my knowledge on the subject, you know, of everything that might go right, might go wrong, and, and what usually happens under similar circumstances. So at the moment, you know, I'm going to work. I know for a fact we've had a ton of phone calls over um, the weekend, and we've had a, sent out a bunch of links. What we do is we get a phone call. It's always on a mobile. We say to that person, we'll send you a text back. In the text is a link. Click the link and it takes you to a short online questionnaire, which is on Google Forms, which just asks you if you've been in contact with anyone and whether you're ill, whatever, and ask you what you, a few details, basically uh, name, date of birth, and uh, mobile phone number, and then uh, an email. Not the address, we're not that bothered about the address now these days. Um, and then, what, and then what, yeah, then we get like an email saying someone's added to your Google spreadsheet, and, um, and then we either make them an appointment if it's fairly straightforward, or we ring them up and ask them what the problem is, you know. This is why I'm so pleased that we've got Ellie now working for us because honestly I think she couldn't have come a moment sooner. Uh, she, was, she was absolutely uh, this testing facility. This is our local COVID testing facility. Someone I know is going to get tested there at nine o'clock this morning. We might have some further developments on that if I don't watch out. But. Um, So, we don't really want to put the prices up to suppress demand. We tend to put prices up to, um, we tend to put prices up to cover costs and wages. We don't put uh, prices up to suppress demand. Uh, I think, think what we'll do is we'll allow ourselves to get booked up slightly further ahead, which has the dual uh, advantages of um, making us feel better because having that volume of work all booked in uh, is, uh, is good. Um, because our patients pay in advance, it's not, it won't make much difference to be honest because they only have to pay two days in advance. So really only you, you've only got in hand the money that's coming in in the next two days. So don't run away with the idea that uh, you're going to have a ton of other people's money in your bank account that you can spend, uh, and you can't spend it anyway because really it is in, in escrow in effect. Uh, I think it's quite surprising that we're allowed to charge people and not uh, have an escrow account in the same way as all solicitors do and stuff like that. But, What, um, yeah, so we've had to, as I say, we've had to take on a receptionist 
I'm pleased she has because, you know, she's dealing with a ton of work now. We didn't really have a ton of work before we hired her. We, we uh, had a, an inkling that a ton of work was on its way because things were hotting up. Um, today is the uh, May a, a 17th, which is the uh, COVID release date for indoors. So uh, now if you want to drink inside a pub, you can today, which is just as well, because if you look at the weather, the jet stream is so far south of us, it's over Gibraltar. So we've got this uh, horrible series of low lows coming over, one after the other. Don't do it. Let's just pull down. That should be me. I should cycle to work. I'd be fit as a butcher's dog if I cycled to work. I'm probably dead within three months. I'd be flattened by a car or a lorry. Yeah, so uh, Ellie's really going to get in the next morning. And the trouble is, I don't think we've got enough space to fit all these emergencies in. And although we will fit them in, even if we have to stay late. Uh, so what I might have to do is ask her what the best time of the day is to um, put some more emergency sessions in. Um, possibly only on a Monday, but uh, at the moment we have one entire hour of the day devoted to emergencies. And the other dentists in the area know this and they send the emergency patients to us. I think it's because they think that uh, do you, they think it's because um, they're a nuisance and I think they think that by getting rid of a nuisance for them they're creating a nuisance for us but in fact it's nothing like that at all oh, <clears throat> every patient that comes in that you haven't seen before is a blank check and it's up to you how much you write it for uh, depending on your diagnostic skills and your sales skills here we go who's parked their red car in front of my no parking sign we'll have to get that moved out of the way Is he one of ours?